I am pleased first to welcome Andre Gerits, who is a professor of Russian history and politics at the University of Leiden, Leiden, which way you say it. Uh, Professor Gerrits directs also European Union studies and is a specialist on international relations and EU's foreign policy issues. He has been an active commentator on the current situation in Ukraine and what it means for European politics. The title of his talk is plain and simple, Europe between Germany and Russia. Please, floor, floor is yours. Uh, which gives me the opportunity to um, improvise a bit on some of the issues which you have mentioned in your, um, in your introduction. First of all, Europe between Germany and Russia, question mark. Well, the topic we're discussing today uh, can not be just approached from a, let's say, purely scholarly perspective. It's inevitably political. And my first response to the question, Europe between Germany and Russia, is a political response, which is, thank God, no. Uh, the Ukrainian crisis has shown so far that if you want to use these three designations, Europe, Germany, and Russia, it is Europe with Germany against Russia. Now, the against Russia part, um, obviously, is hugely problematic, but the with Germany part of this very same sentence is, uh, of course, one of the most important and very highly welcome um, developments um, over the last uh, couple of months. Germany has shown to be, again, I would argue, a very responsible leading partner in uh, Europe, in the European uh, Union. The other issue, a return to um, sphere of, spheres of influence in Europe, um, I would formulate it differently if I would respond to that. And I would argue it's not so much a return to a spheres of influence, in, it's not so much a return to spheres of influence in Europe, but it is certainly a return to great power politics in Europe, which we, in any way, in our part of the continent, now Finland and the Netherlands are not in the very same part of Europe, but politically we are, obviously. Um, we have to get used to that again, that great powers do play their great power games um, in the European continent. And thirdly, um, a return to the Cold War, another popularly uh, or frequently used popular uh, label for the current crisis. I would argue no, it's not a return to the Cold War, but it definitely is, whatever that may mean, it definitely is um, an end to the post-Cold War era. Now, we were not really aware on how to call the era which followed on the Cold War, therefore post-Cold War era, but despite the fact that we didn't have a label for the first 20 years after the Cold War, we are entering a new era, I would argue, a post-Cold post War one, if you can still follow me. Um, and obviously, we are still lacking a label to sharply define this, this, this moment in European politics. Okay, I'm going to focus on the role of Russia, which I do with a bit of reluctance, given the fact that I'm in Finland, and Finland, way more than the Netherlands, has a very strong reputation in Russian studies, uh, and for sure, and obviously there are some Russian experts, perhaps even Russians, in the room. Um, so, I'm a bit careful, I'm a bit reluctant here, but still, I want to share with you my ideas about the current crisis in Ukraine, around Ukraine, and how we should or could possibly deal with it. My PowerPoint presentation consists of two parts. Um, actually, the, the question I which I would like to answer is, Ukrainian crisis, has anything really changed? Is the, UK, is the Ukrainian crisis what many people believe it is, namely a sort of breaking point, a sort of entering a new era, as I just put it, the post-Cold post, post -Cold War one? What has really changed? Well, we are, nobody knows, halfway the crisis. Um, maybe the crisis will drag on for another few years. Maybe the ceasefire will, to a certain extent, hold. 
And we will be seeing openings towards a, polit a political settlement. Nobody knows, nobody really has a clue, which of course makes this crisis so extremely dangerous. Um, my PowerPoint consists of two parts. If you want to post a question, what is going to change, or has anything really changed? Obviously, obviously, you need to go into, first and foremost, into what might change, or what might have already changed. That's the first part of my PowerPoint. Very quickly and very briefly, um, I will leave it here with the, with the foundation, so if you're interested, you can, um, you can read or check my PowerPoint presentation later. This is an argument against all those who believe that Russia uh, is a marginal power and an argument, against, an argument against all those who believe that the crisis in Ukraine is a sort of, I don't know, a final attempt by the Russians to, to prove themselves as a powerful uh, nation, as a powerful state. Um, we need Russia for practically all global issues and practically all global problems. This is not a plea for detente or whatever, um, just a reminder of how important Russia really is. Russia's foreign policy has changed over the two post-Cold War decades. Now we tend to link that with political individuals, the Yeltsin years and the uh, Putin years. Obviously Russian foreign policies, which includes also Russia's current foreign policies is much more than just agency, much more than just leadership and the private ideas of individuals. Despite the fact that there is a sort of a consistent rumor about Putin being hardly accessible anymore for any policy advisors, with very few exceptions. Um, but still, Russian foreign policy is minimally a combination of agency and structure and structure, again, has a double context, the domestic resources and international resources. Even if Putin would have been, politically speaking, totally comparable with, the, with Yeltsin, politically speaking, as a leadership, his world outlook, then still Russian foreign policy would, of course, be very, very different today from what it was 20 years ago. Local conditions and the international environment have changed almost beyond recognition. Local conditions in Russia have very much favored strong leadership, almost undisputed leadership, not fully undisputed as we all know. And the, and the international environment has been highly beneficial to the Putin leadership, way more than to the Yeltsin one. The conclusion, I would have argued before the Ukrainian crisis is um, that Putin's foreign policy, Putin slash Medvedev foreign, foreign policy can, is best labeled, best defined as great power pragmatism. Great power pragmatism has a couple of features. First and foremost, while all of you are familiar with Russia, obviously know it, Russia is a typically Hobbesian power, a typically realist power, uh, which attaches enormous importance to sovereignty, to independence, to autonomy. I have here a very recent quote by Putin, 22nd of July 2014, which is a very telling quote as a matter of fact, and also a disturbing one to a certain extent. Russia is fortunately not a member of any alliance. This is also a guarantee of our sovereignty. Any nation that is part of an alliance gives up, gives up part of its sovereignty. This gives away in two sentences, the world outlook of the Putin leadership. We have to maximize power. We have to keep and guard our sovereignty to the utmost extent. We got to be sovereign, we got to be autonomous. This, I would argue, is the world outlook of in any way a large part of Russia's political elite, which of course conflicts very, very sharply with the world outlook, if you like, the Weltanschauung of, for example, the European Union. It's no wonder that we have been struggling with the Russians for how many years now to, to strike a new partnership agreement. We have not come to that new partnership agreement yet. 
Part of the reason, obviously, is that we have two very conflicting worldviews. Not totally, it's not a black and white picture. The EU is very much about inclusion, but it's also about exclusion, as you're all familiar with. The same goes mutatis mutandis for the Russian Federation. But overall, I would argue, these are conflicting, if not dichotomous, world outlooks. Integration versus sovereignty versus full sovereignty and full autonomy. It proves to be extremely difficult to really bridge that difference. Well, these are Russia's priorities as I see it, first and foremost to serve the regime's material interests and to maximize its economic opportunities. The major reason why this is so incredibly important is because for the first time in the history of Russia, I would argue, the country is ruled by the very same people who actually own it very different from the good old communist days, and even different to a certain extent from pre-1917 Russia. Today, the country is being ruled by the very same persons who own it. There is no distinction anymore, if you would ask me, between Russia's political interests, its geopolitical interests, and its economic interests. A second priority is establishing greater security on Russia's periphery. A third priority is sustaining Russia's global role, and a fourth one, and definitely the least important one, that is to take care of the well-being of ethnic Russians beyond the borders of the Russian Federation. All these issues, all these priorities, return in Russia's foreign policy towards what's well, not just foreign policy anymore, towards Ukraine. This obviously is the area we are uh, discussing here, the post-Soviet area, the near abroad. Um, the geopolitical features of the near abroad I have very briefly uh, summarized as volatile, under-institutionalized, non-democratic, challenged, but geopolitically extremely irrelevant. Ukraine is not the first crisis in Russia's near abroad, if I'm allowed to use that notion, and it's not going to be the last crisis. There are already rumors, or no, well, not full discussions, that would be unacceptable, but rumors going on among Russia's pundits and its political thinkers that um, the next important focus of Russian foreign policy within its own neighborhood will undoubtedly be Kazakhstan, which has problems related to Ukraine, different but related. Uh, the major, major difference, apart from the fact that Ukraine is also and has always been partly focused on the West, the major difference probably is stable leadership and relatively good governance in Kazakhstan and unstable leadership and very poor governance in Ukraine. But stability in Kazakhstan is very much linked to one person, as we all know, to Nazarbayev. And uh, things will become definitely more complicated once he will leave the stage. Right, this was... Background information in 10 minutes, now the Ukrainian crisis itself. What has really changed? I'll make a distinction between three dimensions, global consequences, Russian foreign policy, and how to solve the issue. Yeah, particularly the third question obviously is rather challenging, but we'll see. You're all familiar with Ukraine. You're all familiar with the fact that the country is in a way divided and has always been divided. And the country knows a very brief history of independent state existence. Um, this, this division of Ukraine is one of those issues, I will argue, that the European Union has always conveniently tended to forget. I'll return to that later. <coughs> this is the ethnic divide to the extent that one might, um, so the, the, the image on the left, the ethnic divides to the extent that one can ethnically divide a Russian from a Ukrainian, but again, for the sake of argument. And this is the political divide Presidential leadership? Yeah. In 2010, well, as we all know, it's not a secret, <coughs> ethnic divides and political divides in Ukraine, pre-Maidan Ukraine, were not totally separate things. A very brief chronology of the crisis, because it's, I think, advisable every now and then to keep in mind what actually happened and what followed on what. Okay, we have the surprising rejection by the Yanukovych leadership of the EU offer to join, in very simple terms, EU's economic zone, to the utter surprise of the Europeans, to the utter surprise of the European Union, and accepting the 15 billion Russian counter offer. 
This is the beginning, in a way, of what we are witnessing now, the Ukrainian crisis. The Maidan Square revolt, we're all familiar with. We see the remnants of this revolt are still visible in the um, center of Kiev. But then, way more important is the deal which Yanukovych, against all expectations, struck with his own opposition, part of his opposition, under the supervision of three European ministers of foreign affairs, France, Germany, and Poland, if I remember correctly. A, an, a deal which was as surprising in a way as Yanukovych's earlier rejection of um, the EU offer. And then things went wrong in any way from the Russian perspective. Yanukovych himself collapsed, the deal collapsed, Yanukovych himself collapsed, fled to Russia and the European Union without any single second thought, accepted the, except the fact that the deal was off the table. Well, this, excusez le mot, pissed the Russians off, and tremendously. All of a sudden, Ukraine moved to the West, whatever way you look at it. That was the, and anyway, that was how the Russians read the fact that the deal of February 2014 was off the table, all of a sudden. This, I think, was a clear signal to the Putin leadership. Either we act now, or nobody will ever take us seriously anymore. I'm not defending what Russia actually did, that is seizing the Crimea, for which of course contingency plans were ready, but I'm just giving you the order of things. Russia essentially responded. Russia's posture was more reactive than active during the days of the acute crisis. I think we should understand the Ukrainian situation as um, the result of competing geopolitical projects. On the European slash, slash, uh, slash Western side, we have the Western democratization effort. This is a quote um, by Victoria Nuland, well, it's not an uh, uh, exact quote, under Secretary of State of the United States administration uh, confirming that the US has spent more than $5 billion for the future which Ukraine deserves, read for the democratization of Ukraine. The West has never really closed off the <coughs> potential entrance of Ukraine into NATO. But the most important, I would argue, the most important responsibility as far as western as far as the western world is responsible for the current ukrainian crisis were the policies of the european union and what i would argue are the, is the twin fallacy of the eu policy towards ukraine over the years if not over the decades one this this persistent idea among eu politicians and eu officials that eu external relations are a win win affair by definition. A win-win affair by definition. It's a win-win game. What the EU is doing is a win-win game. Everybody benefits. Well, that is what Brussels thinks. It's not the interpretation of Moscow or China or even the United States when it comes to their interpretations of EU external relations. Most certainly not Russia's. And the second fallacy is that the EU in the Ukrainian crisis kept on believing, or in any way kept on insisting, that there was a sort of a dichotomous political situation in Ukraine. You had the people, you had the elite. If it were up to the people, the West orientation for Ukraine would be without any doubt. Unfortunately, it's that corrupt elite which frustrates the ambitions of the Ukrainian population at large. Now, the elite is corrupt. Very few countries in Europe are more poorly governed than Ukraine has been over the last 20 years. But there, is, there has never been this absolute dichotomy between good Ukrainians and bad Ukrainians from the EU perspective. Um, there has never been this, this dichotomy between the leadership and the average population. The average population has always been divided, most certainly on potential NATO membership, but also on potential EU membership. Whatever way you look at it, EU membership 
even the Ukraine entering a larger European economic zone was not beneficial in objective terms to a large part of the East Ukrainian population. Because the eastern part of Ukraine is, was, and is very much linked also economically with the Russian Federation. Okay, the Russian response. As I would put it in very, very simple terms, Russia, as far as Ukraine is concerned, had legitimate concerns which they attempted to solve by highly illegitimate means. This is exactly why the Ukrainian crisis leads to such extremely divergent responses, also in Western Europe and certainly also in the United States. Some people have the inclination, particularly also in Russia, to approach the issue politically. Others approach it from a legal point of view. If you approach the issue from a political point of view, as the Russians do, it's very well acceptable, well, it's very well understandable and to a certain extent acceptable the behavior of the Russian political elite over the last six months. If, however, you approach the Ukrainian issue from a legal point of view, it's totally unacceptable, totally illegitimate. Russia basically violated the sovereignty and the territorial integrity of an independent and sovereign country. The funny thing is that Russia and the West have switched perspectives in this crisis. If you compare the Ukrainian crisis to the Kosovo crisis, for example, Russia, or we, the West, um, approach that issue in a political way, human rights, the right to defend uh, the rights of the Kosovars, etc., etc., while the Russians approach it from a legal point of view. You have violated the national sovereignty of Serbia. The difference between there are a lot of differences, but one of the most telling differences between the Kosovo crisis and the Ukrainian crisis is that the West and Russia have switched paradigms, have switched approaches. Why are Russia's concerns legitimate from a realist perspective? First of all, because Ukraine has always proved to be, at least in the, po the post-Cold War era, weak, fragile, unreliable, but containing crucially important industries. It's a very very disturbing combination from the perspective of the Kremlin. Secondly, um, the Ukrainian crisis is, whatever way you look at it, a political, ideological, and to a lesser extent, a military threat in Russia's own backyard. I hesitate to do it, but by way of comparison, would the United States accept a communist Mexico? Right? Thirdly, the Crimea and eastern Ukraine, um, the idea basically is, if I read Russia's intentions correctly, that is to weaken and to destabilize Ukraine and to frustrate its westward turn. That's basically what the Russians want. They want no land, they want no permanent taking care of their so-called fellow Russians in the eastern part of Ukraine, no. They want to further destabilize the, the, the Ukraine while having, while having a, a, a certain influence on where Ukraine will be moving. That's sort of a superficial reading of Russia's intentions. There might be more to it, obviously, and I mentioned it here briefly. Indeed, one might argue that Russia is increasingly in the business, seems to be increasingly in the business of authoritarianism export. We promote it. Democracy, if you like, the Russians are promoting authoritarianism, which is bad news for Russia's environment. Ukraine might be part of this picture. Russia does not accept anymore any non-authoritarian regime at its own borders. Secondly, you might also see the Ukrainian crisis in this more complex and larger issue of rising Russian nationalism, rising Russian conservatism even a clash of values which is being used at this very moment, which is being used with regard to this crisis by the Russians themselves. This would give the Ukrainian crisis almost a sort of an ideological dimension. Um, and it's part of the crisis for sure. And finally, Russia might be losing its Europe connection or its European connection instead of being able, us and the Russians, to create a sort of pan-European security order, 
We have, exact, we have reached the exact opposite situation. Russia is drifting away from Europe, which, of course, in itself is a dangerous development. Right, how are we going to solve the Ukrainian crisis? Good question. Um, there are a couple of scenarios. War. It's, despite the truce, the ceasefire, it's today's scenario. Now, in general, ladies and gentlemen, I would not be against fighting a good war. Give war a chance, so to speak. Our experience with, with, with interventions into war situations, political interventions, military interventions into war situations, tells us that if a war wasn't really decided on the battlefield, post-war political constructions might take a very, very long time. Look at Bosnia. So perhaps in terms of building a viable post-war political um, reconstruction, maybe it's better to just finish that war first. But maybe not. Um, and the major reason why I'm against, why I'm against it, apart obviously from, from, from human misery and human suffering, is that this is still a, lo uh, a local conflict. That's a very dangerous local conflict. Continuing the war is likely but highly unattractive because nobody knows how it will escalate, whether it will escalate and how it will develop. Uh, that's the extreme danger of events. The downing of the MH17, this Malaysian Airlines airplane, is an example of an event which could, and which did, as a matter of fact, had a, um, an escalating impact on international relations in Europe. The war is local and localized, but potentially too dangerous to keep it ongoing. Sanctions. Sanction the Russians into submission. It's costly for us, and it's unlikely because the Putin leadership is very, very far removed from the general Russian population, and they basically don't give a damn. Um, for those who are more familiar with Russian political culture, obviously a large part of the Russians distrust their leadership. They've always done so. But way more important for understanding recent Russian history, if not Russian, hist Russian polit political history in general, is not that the population mistrusts its leaders, but that the leaders have always mistrusted their population, and they still do. So sanctions will not um, force the Russians to make the concessions towards Ukraine, which we want them to uh, do. The Finland scenario, excuse me, I'm in Finland here, but um, the Finland scenario, it's internally democratic, externally neutral. It's highly attractive from our perspective, even from the Finnish perspective, I would argue, because it means that the crisis has been solved. And who cares whether the Ukrainians become member of NATO? I would be against it, as a matter of fact. Why would NATO accept such an extremely poorly governed and poor and corrupt country? I personally would rather have the Ukrainians outside of NATO than inside of NATO. So the combination of an internationally neutral and domestically democratic Ukraine would almost be too beautiful to envision. And that's the major reason why it's not going to happen, probably, if only because Ukraine itself is too in divided, too internally divided to accept, at least for the time being, this Finland scenario. Well, you have the division. It's also an interesting one. Just leave the eastern part of Ukraine to whomever wants it. That is, the Russians all those criminal gangs that are fighting the war at this very moment, and then the rest of Ukraine moves to the west. Um, and is lost to the Russian Federation. Um, there are quite a few Russian pundits, quite a few Russian journalists who have suggested this scenario. Just leave you eastern Ukraine to the eastern Ukrainians. It's unattractive because the Kiev government won't accept it, and for that simple reason it's unlikely. There's another reason why it is unlikely. Nobody wants this independent or quasi-independent Eastern Ukraine. Nobody, including the Russian Federation. Finally, and that is the most 
perhaps the most likely, but in any way the most, it would be the most welcome development, that is a decentralization of Ukraine and NATO, um, um, or less accepting, and the Ukrainians from their side accepting that Ukraine needs to have a sort of a neutral position in Europe. If it is anything between Russia and uh, Europe, let it be a bridge rather than a bastion for either the Russian part of the continent or the, um, or the uh, European one. So decentralization, I would argue, is both a viable, an attractive and a viable scenario. Okay, this brings me to the, uh, the final part of my presentation, global consequences. Is, is it a new era in global politics? Is it the new Cold War? No, it isn't, at least for the time being, as yet. The nature of the conflict is totally different. It's regional rather than global. It's a political conflict rather than an ideological and a military conflict. But, as I said, the risk of escalation is very much there. It's not a new, go not a new Cold War because Russia's ambitions and capabilities still remain limited. The Russian leadership is relatively realistic. Um, the second major reason why it's not a Cold War, why it's not a new Cold War, is because the Ukrainian conflict rather confirms than conflicts with ongoing global trends. And we're all familiar with the various aspects of those trends, the emerging powers, great power competition and rivalry, non-polarity. It's not very difficult to, to analyze the Ukrainian conflict within let's say, those aspects which, which define our post Cold War order. Uh, but what it is, that is, it definitely finalizes, it definitely ends the post-Cold War era in Europe. Uh, and a couple of reasons why. Because of the return of great power politics to the European continent. Unpleasant in a way, but inevitable, I would argue. Major part of this return of, of uh, great power politics is, of course, the totally different position of Russia within the European continent from a partner, an official partner of the EU, of NATO, to an opponent and an adversary. And thirdly, the Ukrainian crisis signals a definite change in the EU, in EU's relations towards Russia. If you want to summarize EU's policies towards Russia over the last two decades, it would be from transformation and attempts at integration to the situation we have today, which is basically confrontation. So we have entered a new era, but it's not a new Cold War. So if there are any volunteers who have the imagination to come up with labels for the period we are currently entering, would be very welcome. Is it a new Russia? I believe this is my final slide. Is it a new Russia? No. My argument would be that Russian foreign policy is still essentially assertive instead of aggressive. It's mostly non-ideological and ad hoc. And that is what Russian foreign policy has always been, that is, in any way, during the post-Cold War era. But things are changing. I'm not naive. I do see that Russian foreign policy is changing. Three final comments. Russian foreign policy became way more aggressive and intimidating, particularly in its own neighborhood. Not so much towards the West or any other global power, but in its own neighborhood. But it also became more confrontational in global politics. In other words, Russia defines its national interests in a less narrow manner than it did um, during the last two decades. And these confrontations can be recognized at different places, different moments in global politics. Syria, of course, is a beautiful example of Russia following almost against the priorities of any other major power, following its own foreign policies. I would argue that Russian policies towards Syria might even have been more sophisticated than some aspects of the policies of the United States and Western Europe. That is for a different discussion, but still. Just to stress the fact that Russia is not a sort of a totally irresponsible bully in international relations. Second issue, 
Russian foreign policy becomes more ideologically motivated, as I already indicated. There is a link, I would argue, there is a link between what Russia's priorities are in the eastern part of Ukraine, vis-a-vis -vis Europe, vis-a-vis -vis the United States, and this, this sort of return of Russian nationalism, maybe we spent some time at it in the Q&A session, there is a sort of a return, a re-emergence of Russian nationalism. And the two things are linked, and they strengthen one another. Seizing the Crimea was partly inspired, obviously, by the perceived Russian national interest. And having seized the Crimea, strengthened again this sense of Russian nationalism in Russian domestic politics. It's the major reason why Putin all of a sudden became way more popular among those parts of the population did, which did not support his re-election in 2012. It's the, the, the force of Russian nationalism, I would argue. And finally, in strategic terms, Russian foreign policy becomes less ad hoc and more strategic, more expensive. It has a more expensive and it has a more consequential definition of its national interest, and it's openly challenging for the first time since the Cold War, it's really openly challenging the US-dominated global order. Thank you very much.